today we will discuss about the vertical cavity surface emitting laser. This is a variation, so it is a Vixel vertical cavity surface emitting laser. We can think of this as a variation of DBR laser. In the last class we discussed about uh, DFB and DBR laser, DBR laser distributed Bragg reflector laser. So, recall the DBR structure. So, here is the active region and there are corrugations here that is periodic uh, periodic structure the frequency selective periodic corrugations there and this is the DBR. And I had discussed that this was basically you had a cavity here, a Fabry Perot. How this came up? That if we can put frequency selective layers here, frequency selective reflection layers. Each layer is of thickness lambda by 4 n. So, these are the Bragg stacks. So, the Bragg stack. That is one high index layer. So, if you want to um, expand this and see, these are basically high, low, high, low. So, n high, n low, n high and low. And thickness of each layer here, thickness here is T is equal to lambda. Lambda is the wavelength that you want to select. So, lambda or lambda 0 divided by 4 times n. The thickness of each layer, water wavelength thickness, each one of them. So, that forms a reflector for this wavelength, lambda 0. So, this is the basic idea from which the DBR structure had come. Now, if you look at this, see the origin of Vixel, if I rotate this through 90 degrees, just rotate this through 90 degrees. So, what we have is a structure like this. The cavity, in this case the cavity, the mode is going back and forth in this direction. So, the cavity is horizontal, the cavity is horizontal, the mode is going back and forth. If I rotate this, the cavity is vertical. So, this is vertical cavity. Just rotate it through 90 degrees. However, typical length here in a DBR or this structure is approximately this length is about 500 micrometer. In a normal uh, Fabry Perot laser, the length is normally about 300 micrometer, and in, uh, fab, uh, in DFB and DBR, it is 500 to 1000 micrometer, typically between 500 and 1000 micrometer, because you need a relatively longer lengths for getting sufficient feedback. If the length is very small, the feedback is not sufficient and that is why normally the length is more than 500 micrometers. So, if you take this structure, even if you take 300, this height is very large. In the sense, if you want to fabricate, from a fabrication point of view, you will always start with a substrate here, then whatever layers that you want to deposit, epitaxially you deposit whatever thickness that you want. And then if you wanted this, a thick layer here, it is normally not possible by epitaxy to grow layers thicker than 10 micron. By epitaxy, normally you can grow layers 0.1 micrometer, 1 micrometer, 2 micrometer, 5 micrometer. But normally it is not possible to grow thick layers. Which means, in this structure, if I want to grow a vertical cavity, that is I want to make a laser, starting with substrate here, you deposit 
the Bragg stacks here, the Bragg stacks for reflection and then you deposit the active medium and then you have a, an, again a Bragg stack for reflection. So this is in principle it is fine, the reflectivity, the, there are mirrors of reflection R1 here, R2, please see this is R1, R2 which stacks provide reflectivity. So, R1, R2 and this is the active medium. So, you in the active medium if you, you need a double heterostructure, so there is a double heterostructure here. And what results is the vertical cavity surface emitting laser. Why is it surface emitting now? Because in this case light was coming here. In all these light is coming from the edge. In all these lasers, light comes from the edge. But in this case, if you realize a laser substrate, then this is light is building up in this direction and therefore light is coming here from the surface. The cavity is vertical, light emission is from the surface. Please recall a normal laser reflectivity at one end if you are depositing yourself you want this to be 100 percent let us say this is 100 percent and this is 95 percent or 90 percent these reflecting layers please see this is no more cleaved edges it is reflecting layers which you have deposited so you have made reflectivity 100 percent reflectivity 90 percent which means 10 percent of light is coming out of the cavity so, I have just rotated this and made this cavity here. So, you have made a reflectivity nearly 100 percent and reflectivity nearly 90 percent, let us say. Then 10 percent of the light is coming out. This is the structure. So, vertical cavity surface emitting laser. So, it is vertical cavity on the substrate you have grown and surface emitting. This is the vertical cavity surface emitting laser. There are several design considerations involved. What kind of reflectivities do we need? So, some numbers if we put it will be more clear. So, let us see a little bit of uh, analysis there, but the basic idea of realizing a vertical cavity surface emitting laser is straightforward. It is simply it is a variation of a DBR laser where you have rotated the cavity to 90 degrees. So, that output is coming from the surface. Why do we want such a structure? Because then on a chip like this, on a chip you can grow large number of lasers all emitting to the top upward from the so. So, this is the top view I am showing. So, all of these giving light like this. It is an array of vertically emitting from the surface, lasers emitting from the surface. You can make an array of lasers. There are several uh, applications of such arrays including pumping to other lasers. For pumping other lasers, you can make array of such lasers. And today, there are lasers which can give up to 1 watt in this structure. Initially when vertical cavity lasers were made, the output was very small, tens of micro watt. But today there are hundreds of milliwatt from each element is possible. So, the technology has advanced so much. Now, some numbers I want to discuss. So, first the motivation, why go for this? The normal semiconductor lasers as we although they are very small and compact compared to bulk lasers like helium neon laser or NDAG lasers very small very compact about 300 micrometer length or 500 micrometer length. This is very large compared to microelectronic components. Microelectronic components are 1 micron. So, these are these are very large. If, so, very bulky. It is all right for communication from the communication point of view, from an optical communication point of view, such size of devices is fine. 
because you have some sources you may need in a DWDM system, you may need let us say 64 or 128 such lasers. They do not take lot of space. But if you want millions of lasers, as I mentioned, one of the most important applications which has come up is high density. So, high density data interconnects, high density data interconnects. In computer chips. This is a very important uh, because it is also very important because these lasers can be modulated at tens of gigabit per second speed. Directly you can modulate this at speeds of tens of gigabits and you can have a million component on one centimeter square. You can imagine the data density which is possible with the such uh, systems whereas these ones if you want to put a million component it will be very bulky. For communication it is ok because you need one transmitter which may have say tens of uh, laser diodes. But for high density data interconnects this is a primary application for which pixels have been developed. Alright, so I come to the numbers, I come to some numbers. In a normal laser this R was 0.32, cleaved ends reflectivity of 0.32. You recall that we had an expression the resonator loss must be equal to gain for laser oscillation, steady state laser oscillation and resonator loss is given by alpha s plus alpha m, two components, one mainly due to scattering and diffraction losses and second is due to mirrors. So, this mirror loss is 1 over twice L into ln 1 over R1 R2. And typical gain profiles if you see the gain profiles that we had, recall the gains that we had. This is gamma versus energy H nu or lambda for different values of delta n or current. So, I can write in terms of delta n or current, let us say 50 milliampere is the current and this is for 100 milliampere. Typical numbers that we have here are let us say 50 gamma centimeter inverse, so just have a feel for the numbers 100 centimeter inverse and so on. Just I am taking some numbers, so this is h nu or wavelength and then this is the gain curve. So, if gamma is 50 centimeter inverse here, 50 centimeter inverse, I am doing some example calculations, you see the importance why. Alpha s I had mentioned that typically this is in the range 10 to 50 centimeter inverse. Typical numbers for alpha s is in this range. If I take the lowest value here 10, then alpha m can be 40 centimeter inverse. Please see, I am considering a particular example of a particular laser. You are sending a forward current of 50 milliampere and the peak gain coefficient is 50 centimeter inverse. And if I assume that alpha s is 10 centimeter inverse, then alpha m should be is 40 centimeter inverse. Okay? So, alpha m is equal to 40 centimeter inverse. All these numbers are typical numbers. And remember that alpha m is equal to 1 over twice L here into ln 1 over R1 R2. Let me continue with the calculation here. This is a very important example because what I am giving going to do is to give you an answer. Why did we take this as 300 micron? In one of the classes I gave you an answer why the thickness of the layer was 0.1 to 0.2 micron. Now I am going to answer why this was 300 micron. It is not you could you are not just taking arbitrary numbers there are reasons for every number. Alright, so alpha m here is equal to so 40 
40 centimeter inverse is equal to 1 over 2 L into L n R 1, 1 by R 1 R 2. Assume that R 1 equal to R 2, assume that R 1 equal to R 2, for R 1 equal to R 2, what will this be? This will be whole square. So, L n, so 2 2 cancel, so this will be equal to 1 over L into L n 1 over R equal to 40 centimeter inverse or L is equal to 1 over 40 centimeter here 40 into L n 1 over R centimeter. This 40, what was this 40? This was actually gamma minus alpha s. If you want to write formula, it will be 1 by gamma minus alpha s into ln this. In my example, it was 40. Actual formula is 1 over gamma minus ls into ln 1 by r. Okay. If you substitute value, if you put r is equal to 0 0.32, and substitute in this, you will find that L is equal to 285 micrometer. The point is, so if you need 40 centimeter inverse as gamma minus alpha s, then length has to be 285 micrometer if r is this much. If I increase r, what will happen? If I increase r, See this, it is 1 by r, therefore this number will decrease and therefore L will decrease. So, if I put r is equal to 0 0.9, that is 90 percent both mirrors, okay, then you will get L, please check these numbers, approximately L is equal to 10 micrometer. If I make r is equal to 0 0.99, L is nearly equal to 2.5 micrometer. If I make R is equal to 0 0.998, almost approaching 100 percent reflectivity, L is equal to 0 0.2 micrometer. What, what do these calculations tell? You can have thickness of the gain medium, L is what? Length of the gain medium. If I want to reduce this length of the gain medium, the reflectivity must be high, otherwise alpha will blow up, alpha has L in the denominator. So if L reduces, alpha will increase unless I also increase this. If R comes close to 1, note that if R is equal to 1, L and 1 is 0. So, if R comes close to 1, then you can reduce L, otherwise you cannot reduce L. So, in a normal laser, because this was 0 0.32, you require at least 300 micron, that is that much length of the gain medium to make up for the losses from the resonator. If reflectivity is 32 percent, it means 68 percent of light is lost from the resonator to make up for the loss you need length of the gain medium, long enough length of the gain medium so that the light is getting amplified to make up for the losses. So, if the reflectivity is higher, then you can reduce the size. In the vertical cavity structure, as I mentioned, that it is not possible to have such thick layer of active layer. So, you want to have a small active layer thickness, which means the only way you can do is by increasing the reflectivity. This is exactly the idea that in vertical cavity surface emitting lasers, normally people use reflectivity in this range 0 0.998. Then you can have an active medium whose thickness is only 0 0.2 micrometer. Do you follow? So, in this to this example, we have answered this question, why it was 300? Because it was simply cleaved ends, you could not have gone less than that. And how to go to small thicknesses? By increasing high reflectance. And therefore, 
you see now the structure of uh, uh, the vertical cavity surface emitting laser. We will see the structure here. So, here is the uh, vertical cavity surface emitting laser. Please project this. So, there you go, you can see the structure very clearly. Uh, the structure comprises of uh, if you see this is the substrate here, and you have a Bragg stack here which provides reflectivity high reflectivity and then here is the active layer. This active layer is basically a double heterostructure here it is written m q w. I make a statement that today most of the lasers have their active layer as m q w structures multiple quantum well structures. In double heterostructure the active layer is these days multiple quantum well structures. What is this multiple quantum well structure? We will see in the next class, but this is our active region and outside these two are cladding regions. So, this is the active region which forms the double hetero structure and here is the and here is the reflectivity provided by the upper mirror. So, that is a Bragg stack that is a Bragg stack here. So, this is the upper Bragg stack and uh, the other one is the lower Bragg stack. So, we have a basic structure. So, let me uh, draw it here. You have because there is one more layer in between which is missing. So, I will show that. So, you have the active layer here which we normally show by dotted line. Outside this is the cladding region. So, this is the one which forms the double heterostructure, a low band gap material sandwiched between high band gap material. All right. In simple terms, this could be for example, if it is a gallium arsenide laser, then this is gallium arsenide active layer. So, active. So, typically the thickness is 0.2 micrometer. Outside is the cladding layer. If this is gallium arsenide, let me say that this is aluminum gallium arsenide Al 0.3, gallium 0.7 and arsenic. So, both are aluminum gallium arsenide here. So, this is P, this is N, this is P and below this we have the lower Bragg stack. So, here the Bragg stack. So, number of layers are that typically people use about 25 periods here. So, this is the DBR Bragg stack. For example, this Bragg stack may comprise of, of so let me show here, the Bragg stack will comprise of high, low, high, low index layers. So, this is for example, so this is aluminum arsenide aluminum arsenide. This refractive index is 3.2 lower refractive index and this one is gallium aluminum. So, aluminum 0.1 gallium arsenide. So, gallium 0.9 aluminum 0.1 gallium 0.9 arsenide. Remember that gallium arsenide has a refractive index n nearly equal to 3.6 and aluminum arsenide has a large band gap refractive index is 3.2. This is approximately n is equal to 3.5. So, this value here is n. This is n. So, what we have is low refractive index, high refractive index, low, high, low, high. And how do we choose the thickness? If I call this as T1 and this thickness as T2 here, then T1 is equal to 
lambda 0. Let us say the laser is, is gallium arsenide laser, laser is lasing at lambda 0 equal to 0.8 micrometer. Okay. Say for example, the laser wavelength is 0.8 micrometer. Then I have to choose the thicknesses such that lambda 0 divided by 4 times n1 t2 is equal to lambda 0 divided by 4 times n2. I am putting some numbers so that you get a feel for the thickness of the layers. So, what is lambda 0 here? So, lambda 0 is so 0.8. So, T1 is equal to 0 0.8 micrometer divided by 4 into n1. n1 is uh, 3.2. So, 3.2. So, this is 4 times 1 by 16. So, this is nearly equal to 1 by 16 is uh, approximately equal to 0.6. Okay, 0.6 micrometer. 0 0.06, 0 0.06 micrometer. That is approximately 600 angstrom. The thickness of this layer, T1. Similarly, you calculate T2, substitute 3.5 here, and you will get T2 nearly equal to 500. Okay, let me just see. This is. Uh, 4 times 3.5, 14. So, 0 0.8 by 14. 0 0.8 by. Sorry? So, 600 into 10 to the power minus 9. It should be. It should be 600 into 10 to the power minus 10. It should be 10 to the power minus 9. One second. This is nanometer, nanometer uh, micrometer, micrometer. 0 0.06 into 10 power. So, this is, uh, wait, 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 no, 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 not nanometer, right, it is not nanometer, just a minute, 0 0.8 divided by 4 into 34 in 16, so this is micrometer, which is equal to 800, so multiply 800 divided by 16 nanometer, so this is equal to uh, 600, so 60, 60 something nanometer, that is 600 angstrom, oh, 5. So, this is, oh, I should have written 16, so exactly 500, right. So, this is, so this is nanometer, so 50 nanometer, so this is equal to 500 angstrom. So, it is not, uh, so the, in this case it is exact, so I am sorry, so please correct this. So, 0 0.05 micrometer, which is 500 angstrom. Anyhow, the order was right, but uh, it is good you interrupted that we have got the correct value now, that is 500 angstrom, all right. Similarly, please calculate for the other one. I have used the right values. So, this is T1 and T2, calculate this T2. So, T2 is equal to 0 0.8 by 14. So, this will be approximately 500 is 70 and uh, again 10, 560, 560 angstrom. Now, why did I write this? So, one is approximately 500 angstrom and another is 560 angstrom. So, if you add lambda, the period, please see the period here. This is lambda period is equal to T1 plus T2, which is equal to T1 plus T2 is equal to 560 plus 500 is 1060 angstrom. So, 1060 angstroms is 106 nanometer or equal to nearly equal to 0 0.1 micrometer is the period. So, typically people use here 25 periods and for the upper bracket stack here, I also have an upper bracket stack. which is there in the diagram here. So, this is the upper bracket stack, 20 periods 
So, d b r upper Bragg stack approximately 20 periods. 20 periods means this will come out to be about nearly equal to 2 micrometer thickness. You see why I have put all these numbers is you get an idea what kind of thickness otherwise uh, if you just write a structure like this you have no idea what is the actual value and what kind of thickness here this is approximately 2.5 micrometer and below is the substrate substrate is generally about 50 to 60 micrometer on that you have a Bragg stack 2.5 micrometer 25 periods larger the number of period larger will be the reflectivity please see this the reflectivity of the stack is given by the next slide there shows you the reflectivity all right let me what will i erase <laughs> so if you plot this reflectivity i am plotting reflectivity reflectivity is given by the formula there 1 minus n low by n high to the power 2 n divided by 1 plus n low by n high to the power 2 n whole square. So, that is the reflectivity of a Bragg stack a periodic structure where n is the period capital N is the period. So, if I plot n here versus reflectivity typically the reflectivity varies like this. So, this is 1, 1.0 and here this is approximately 0 0.96, this is 10, 20, 25, 15. So, what I have plotted please see is see this graph clearly reflectivity versus so this is 0 0.96 this is 0 0.98 so 0 0.98 0 0.98 so by taking 20 to 25 periods the reflectivity is approaching 0 0.995 996 998 so that is why you take 25 periods here so, that this reflectivity is approaching almost 100 percent and this is almost 99.5 percent. So, the structure now I hope the structure is getting clear. So, let us go back and see the structure there in color. This is the active region, cladding region, the Bragg stacks, these are the Bragg stacks. So, it is I have written 25 Bragg stacks here. 25 periods here is called the Bragg stack is a stack of layers and above this you have the annular electrode and uh, the window window for the laser light to come out. So, this is the metallic electrode the contact positive. So, this is P plus gallium arsenide. So, this is the Bragg stack which is N Bragg stack and this is P Bragg stack. Twenty periods and here is the P plus and this is N plus substrate. So, this is a longitudinal cross section what is shown on the screen is vertical cross section of the laser. So, the figure is there and I have drawn the same thing. So, you can see how much is this total height on top of the substrate this is 2.5 this is about 1 micron 0 0.2 0 0.6 1 micron this is 2. So, 3.5 2.56 and maybe about 6 7 micron that is all the total height from the on top of the substrate. So, substrate is below 50 to 60 micron 
and this is an annular electrode. So please remember that if you see the 3D view, then it would have an annular electrode. I unfortunately I did not have a diagram which showed a 3D view. So here is the so the light is lasing here in between, it is building up here. So the light is building up here and coming out from the circuit. There is a bottom electrode here as well. There are You can imagine what is the need for this. We have discussed this in the case of uh, LEDs, surface emitting LEDs, same reason. Unless you block this, the carriers would go here. So if this is blocked, this is SiO2, usually SiO2 this is oxide layer, blocking layer, then the carriers would go like this. And so that light is generated here because you want light to come out here. If this is not there, then the carriers will flow here. So that is why this layer is used, isolation, oxide isolation layer or blocking layer. So that the light is generated in the central portion and this is the top view, so light comes from here. So usually the electrode is annular and the output that you get is a circular. One of the important advantages of wick cell over the fabry perot lasers, we have discussed the output characteristics of fabry perot lasers. The output is oval in shape. The output is oval in shape because it is highly confined in this direction, less confined in this direction. So, the diffraction leads to an elliptical shape here in the output. Whereas, in this case, it is a circular cross section beam. It is not, con it is confined identical because you see they are all layers. So, it is a plane wave which is going up and down. It is only layer, there is no wave guidance. There is no optical wave guidance here because it is, light is traveling perpendicular to the layers. In this case, there is optical wave guidance. It is like this. Therefore, the beam when it comes out, it diffracts. Here, it is the light is going just up and down, there is no optical wave guidance. And therefore, the beam output is circular in cross section. This is also an advantage. If you want to couple these two optical fibers, the coupling efficiency of this will be much more compared to the coupling efficiency here. Because fibers have a circular cross section and therefore, if the beam is elliptic in cross section, the coupling efficiency will be poor. So, I have taken the example of a gallium arsenide laser here and therefore, the Bragg stacks are normally used made up of aluminum arsenide and aluminum gallium arsenide. But in the case of indium gallium arsenide phosphide lasers, indium gallium arsenide phosphide lasers, usually the Bragg stack comprises of SiO2, TiO2 or SiO2, SI layers, alternate layers of SiO2, TiO2 and SiO2, SI layers. TiO2 is conducting as you know titanium oxide, tin oxide or oh, this titanium oxide. So, it is uh, SiO2, TiO2, titanium oxide and SiO2, SI layers. But you can imagine that these are dielectrics. So, if we put in this case there was no problem, it was semiconductor and this is n doped, all layers are n doped, all layers are p doped. So, it is still a p n junction here. But in the case of SiO2, TiO2 layers, this is a dielectric. So, how the current will flow? In this case, there are structures where the Bragg stack is limited to the center 
and current flows from the side. There are special structures you can see in the literature that the layers do not run from end to end here. They are, the Bragg stack is only in the central region and the sides comprise of uh, semiconductors. So, most of the SiO2, TiO2 Bragg stacks are realized only in the central portion. There are very special structures where you etch and uh, deposit only in the central region because in this region light is building up. One last point is that the length of the cavity here. So, this length we have seen that it is approximately total length is less than or of the order of 10 micrometer. Please recall that this is 2.5 micrometer, this is 2 micrometer and this is about 1 or 2 micrometer which means the total cavity length is less than or of the order of 10 micrometer. If the length is very small, the free spectral range is very large. Recall that the gain spectrum of the semiconductor is this and the cavity resonances are here. These are the cavity resonances with a free spectral range here. So, in both the cases the axis is new. So, this axis is frequency new, new, this is gain gamma and this is resonance frequency is nu q. And this is the free spectral range nu f is equal to c divided by 2 n into l. Unlike the case of bulk semiconductor lasers, here L is very small, L is of the order of 10 micrometer, which means nu f, the free spectral range is large, the separation is large and therefore, normally within the amplification bandwidth, amplification bandwidth is this one, this is the amplification bandwidth because this is the loss line, loss line, recall the last class loss line and this is the gain curve, so gain. So, within the amplification bandwidth that is net amplification where the gain is more than loss, you normally have one more. I have shown in this case there are two, there appears to be two, but normally the separation is large enough so that there is only one longitudinal mode and therefore, usually weak cells are single longitudinal mode structures. So, this also falls in the class of single frequency lasers. Just like DFB and DBR lasers, weak cells are also single frequency lasers because the frequency is selected here also by the Bragg structure and the cavity is also very small and therefore, the free spectral range is also very large. This leads to a single usually a single longitudinal mode oscillating in the structure. There are more advanced structure currently, there are there are several problems with weak cells, several issues that when you have a when you have uh, when you have to grow a large number of weak cells on a substrate, writing this annular electrode, a large number of fabricating annular electrodes on the chip is a problem, but there are methods to overcome them, but that is an issue. The second issue is in terms of transverse field control, control of the transverse field. In this case, the transverse mode is determined by the optical waveguide. So, there is no problem, you know exactly what is the mode shape, what is the transverse field. In this case, there is no guided mode because it is not a waveguiding structure. Therefore, the transverse field distribution of the beam which is coming whether this is Gaussian or whether this has higher order modes, this is an issue and there are large efforts to control this mode profiles of the transverse mode profile. Uh, more recently people are using photonic crystal structures, the upper Bragg stack comprises of photonic crystal structures for controlling the mode shape. So, a large a considerable advances is still going on in the case of weak cells. So, we will stop here for the weak cells and in the next class we will discuss about quantum bell lasers.
Before I proceed with the, the discussion on weak cell, let me discuss a small topic that is a tunable laser based on tunable laser based on DBR structure. In the last class, we had discussed about DFB lasers and DBR lasers and also we have discussed about uh, tunable lasers based on external cavity and rotating grating. So, both are forms of tunable lasers. At another structure which is used as a tunable laser is based on the DBR structure. So, the structure is like this. Let me draw on the board. The structure comprises of two segments. So, this is the active region, the active layer. One segment, the structure has two segments basically. In terms of electrodes, there are two electrodes. In the cladding, the DBR grating is at one end. The DBR grating is only at one end. So, this is the cleaved facet, cleaved facet. This end is anti reflection coated, ER coated, ER coated. And this is the Bragg structure which determines the frequency, Bragg structure. So, depending on the period lambda, so this is lambda, the period is lambda. So, depending on lambda, we have the wavelength, the wavelength lambda b selected will be given by twice n effective into lambda. So, the frequency selective Bragg structure is at one end of the device and this has two electrodes here. So, I am showing these are the contact electrodes, current I 1. So, I 1 is the current through this and I 2 is the current through the two independent electrodes. The current I 1 and I 2 can be controlled separately. This is the active region and the current which is flowing I 1 here across this determines the power that is generated in the medium and the current which is flowing through this can be used to vary the frequency selected. As we know in as we discussed in the last class through Kramer's chronic relation through Kramer's chronic relation through Kramer's chronic relation the refractive index the imaginary part of the refractive index is related to the real part of the refractive index and the frequency nu q, the frequency which is chosen by the structure at lambda b here or the frequency nu q is equal to c by lambda b, the Bragg frequency here which is equal to c divided by twice n effective twice n effective into lambda. By changing the current here, the refractive index of this medium here changes because we are injecting carriers. The carrier injection changes the imaginary component of the refractive index and this in turn causes a change in NR, the real component of the refractive index 
and that causes so here it is n effective n effective is depends on so n effective is the effective index of the mode please see that there is a mode which is propagating here the mode is propagating back and forth n effective is the effective index of the mode which depends on the refractive index of the active region as well as the cladding regions by changing the current i2 we can change the refractive index of the cladding region and therefore we can change the refractive index of n effective and thus we can change the frequency nu q the lasing frequency or nu q in this case let me call it as nu b the bragg frequency because we are using the bragg structure so nu q is the normal notation for the resonance frequency but in this case i will use nu b because we are looking at the bragg frequency so we can vary nu b or lambda b we can vary the bragg frequency or bragg wavelength by changing n effective which takes place due to a variation in the current and this leads to the output which is coming from here so the output is here and this end is anti reflection coated because this part is the so this has two segments the electrodes are independent the current i1 and i2 can be controlled independently i1 is adjusted in such a way that this segment provides gain amplification and therefore the power output is primarily controlled by i1 whereas i2 is used to control the frequency to change the frequency so typical typically one can tune the tunable range tunable range by changing the current is typically of the order of 5 to 10 nanometer in the case of an external cavity laser we know that the tuning range ecl in the case of ecl the tuning range is of the order of 50 nanometers we cannot achieve that kind of tuning range but in general you can vary you can vary the frequency or the wavelength in the range of 5 to 10 nanometers so this is a tunable laser based on the dbr structure we can also tune the frequency we have seen the dfb laser dfb laser structure in which we can tune by temperature temperature tuning temperature tuning usually a change in temperature causes a change in band gap of the active material almost all dfp lasers are provided with a small tuning by temperature a small range of tuning by temperature which is called temperature tuning typically about 1 to 3 nanometers so this is the tuning range approximately 1 to 3 nanometers by changing the temperature temperature tuning typical change is about 0.1 nanometer per degree centigrade per degree centigrade that is delta lambda the change delta lambda is typically about 0.1 nanometer per degree centigrade so by changing the temperature one can tune the laser output changing the temperature temperature tuning primary refers to tuning due to a variation in the band gap variation in the band gap we know that the band gap eg is a function of temperature for semiconductors eg is a function of temperatures and therefore if you change the temperature eg changes band gap changes and therefore the emission wavelength also changes so dfp lasers are usually provided with temperature controls by changing which you can slightly tune the wavelength whereas this is a tunable laser based on the dfb structure so we will proceed so this is another scheme along with the external cavity lasers to achieve 
tunability of the laser output. Note that the change in current here does not cause change in the power, one can maintain the power. We will continue our discussion of weak cells. vertical cavity surface emitting lasers.